Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, April 12th, 2022 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Remember around the time when the spring for shell vulnerability came out, there was all that confusion. There was another vulnerability that was patched in spring and that affected spring cloud function. Now we are seeing active exploit attempts, at least probes for this vulnerability where attackers are checking if you are are using Spring Cloud function by actually looking at the uh, gateway routes uh, URL. So uh, don't forget uh, this particular vulnerability. It's one IP address in particular that does very actively scan for this vulnerability. It also scans for other uh, web vulnerabilities, some of them Java related, but also some totally different and very old uh, PHP vulnerabilities. So it looks like they're trying to add this particular exploit uh, to their repertoire for this particular uh, bot. And talking about applying patches, uh, Microsoft has something new there for enterprises that they call auto patch. Now, when you hear auto patch, it of course uh, sounds very much uh, like the automatic updates uh, that you can enable in consumer windows and uh, well, a lot of operating systems. This one is a little bit different and more targeting enterprises. Essentially what auto patch is doing is it automatically selects uh, some representative systems uh, from your environment and then uh, first installs the patch on a very small number of systems based sort of one out of each category so sort of it identifies checks if the patch works okay only if they work okay then it sort of increases the population of patch devices for a sort of to one percent then nine uh, percent until it then rolls them out to the entire enterprise Price. Interesting system. We'll have to see how this works. But the idea is to sort of automate what a lot of enterprises do anyway, where they first sort of test the patch, uh, then they roll it out to a fairly small population to see sort of how it works in uh, the real world. And uh, then they sort of roll it out uh, to the rest. Some of the checks here are done automatically to make sure that uh, nothing uh, crashes. And as they say, performance goals are met. Also, an administrator is able to then push it from the one group to the next group. And of course, there's also a revert option to undo and remove a particular patch. Sounds interesting. Like I said, we'll have to see how it works in real life. But uh, the approach uh, does appear to make sense. And then we got uh, more protests. They are protesting against Russia's war in Ukraine. Uh, this time, the event source polyfill library is affected. Yet another NPM library. And after 15 seconds, it will display an anti-war message. If your time zone is uh, within a few different countries, essentially Russia, Belarus, and the usual suspects here, Affected here is uh, the event source polyfill library. Polyfill libraries are implementing uh, features that are not natively available in all browsers. So if a browser doesn't support a particular feature, then you can use these uh, polyfill libraries to still use uh, the feature. The problem with this particular one is it's extremely popular. 135,000 GitHub repositories are using it. And just looking at it here on npmjs.com, it has been downloaded 500,000 times this week. And uh, yes, it still appears to be available. And then we have some interesting updates from uh, Raspberry, the next version of their operating system, uh, Bullseye, does introduce an install wizard that no longer can be bypassed, but you have to pick a username. Up to now, the default username was always Pi and the default password Raspberry. Now, uh, Raspberry OS or Pi OS as they're calling it, uh, doesn't enable SH by default, but it is sort of one of our uh, top passwords that users uh, are probing for, even though its popularity has been dropping somewhat over time. 
couple of you asked if this will affect our Honeypot project and no, it doesn't really affect it. Uh, you can install the Honeypot using whatever user uh, you would like. Of course, our documentation currently is still referring to this Pi user and we'll just update this, that this is whatever user you set up uh, during the initial install. Now for the headless setup, and that's uh, sort of, you know, where uh, I think it's really interesting is if you're using the Raspberry Pi Imager, which is a desktop application, allows you to create the initial uh, SD card for your Raspberry Pi while you are creating that initial image, it'll ask you the username and password, also uh, the wireless LAN configuration. So you can set this up right there and that's probably how we'll document it in our Honeypot install documentation. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening and uh, talk to you again uh, tomorrow.